Hi everyone, welcome to Miss Adams Teaches English Language. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Cambridge IGCSE Paper 1 with a specific focus on question 2, A, all the way through to D. So that will be looking at the final text of the paper, but looking at 2A to D, which includes more synonym work and some um, explicit and implicit language analysis in one of the longer questions. So it's a lot to get through and it's worth quite a big chunk of your paper. I'm going to be using the past paper from March 2020 that is all about doctors looking at an extract from Adam Kay's journals. I have put the extract onto the presentation, uh, so if you don't have a copy, you can take a little screenshot of it to help you as you're working your way through the questions. But for now, let's get started. Okay, so let's have a little look at text C. Uh, so we're in the kind of final text of the paper, but mm, probably only not quite even halfway through. Um, Feel free to pause me and have a little read through. The second slide has got the second half of the extract on it. Um, again, when you read it, it's really important that the first thing you do is check out the blurb because that gives you the context of what you're about to read and then read it through very carefully for meaning. And as you're going through, be thinking to yourself, right, what have I just taken in? What has he just said? You know, so try and be as active as you can when you're doing your first read through. Don't worry about the questions or anything else like that yet. Just take it all in. You've got time for a good read. Once you finish reading, unpause me and we'll get back to it. Next part of the text, you'll notice that this actually goes into his journal. So it starts talking about what the text is and and you know why he you know why he wanted to publish the journals and etc and then we get uh, these first three records here at the end of the text okay so we are now going to move on to the questions and we're going to start having a little look at the skills needed so this is question 2a this is just the first half of it because there are four um, parts so identify a word or phrase from the text which suggests the same idea as the words underlined. Now you can't rely on it being in chronological order. This one is, but I have seen a paper where it hasn't been strictly chronological. So don't assume, but fingers crossed. So um, what you need to do is you need to go through the text and you need to start scanning for words OK, that are in line with these ideas. Now, informed, planned choice. OK, so you might think to yourself, right, I'm going to look out for words that are to do with choice, you know, that kind of mean similar things. Put your finger in the middle of the page and then flick your eyes backwards and forwards until you find something relevant. And if I'm flicking my way through, it's the word decision. That has got me. I've gone da, 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 informed plan choice. Ah, active career decision. OK, now it says word or phrase. That is a phrase. If you put in that whole sentence, they wouldn't give you the mark because they re they'd recognize or they'd assume that you're sort of trying to hedge your bets. Likewise, with this next one, when he was training, the idea that he would become a doctor gave Adam the motivation to achieve what he set out to do. Now, one of the clues is in this when he was training. So you've already read through the extract, haven't you? So hopefully in your brain, you'll go all oh, the training bit was in that first couple of paragraphs. So I'm going to look carefully there until I find something that feels similar to achieve what he set out to do propelled me towards my goal. So um, there are my answers for the first two. Again, it's a phrase, it's not a full sentence. Continuing, we've got another two here. So once he had completed his training at medical school, Adam was looking forward to applying what he had learned. Again, use the clues in here. So you know you're looking at the section where he's kind of shifting between the training to being on the ward. So again, you know that you're still in that first half of the first page. So you're going to scan your way through and whoop, here we go. Turn theory into practice. 
OK, and so that's what I've popped in there, applying what he had learned. So the theory is what he had learned and applying it is the practice of it. And then finally, Adam found working as a doctor during the daytime extremely boring. Again, in your brain, you're going to think to yourself, right, so he's now on the ward. So we've got to be about halfway through. I'm going to start looking through the bits that show he's on the ward. Actually, this one was quite nice because it was a paragraph in itself. It was just this bit here. So looking for a word that means extremely boring and you're probably going to pick out their mind numbing. So that's a uh, you've kind of got to know the idiom to get that one right, um, because it's it, you know, it's not a direct synonym. If you see what I mean, you've got to kind of understand the term because it's a bit of a little bit metaphorical and in it goes. OK, so we're doing well. We've got four marks out of four possible marks. So all is good. Now, let's look on to 2B. Now, this is again, it's it's about synonym practice, just like the last one was. But rather than finding, you're having to come up with the synonyms yourself. Now, thankfully, they give you the sentence that they're from. Night shifts were an unrelenting nightmare. At night, you're given a paging device affectionately called a bleep and responsibility for every patient in the hospital. All of them. So the underlined words are in the sentence. So you can look at what they mean within that context. Very important. You are using your own words. OK, so it's coming up with a synonym. OK, so night shifts were an unrelenting nightmare. I here have gone for never ending. So any word or phrase that suggests that there is no let up and no stop. OK, and that is a direct word for word. Yeah. Now, this second one is sneaky because I've seen a number of papers written on this where the person, the candidate has got the answer wrong because they have written lovingly. Now, you can say to me, but Miss Adams, lovingly and affectionately are synonyms for one another. But in this case, what this one is looking for and on the mark scheme, it identifies a different skill. It wants the implicit meaning within the context. So if you actually have a look at night, you're given a paging device affectionately called a bleep. So the paging device is called a bleep, affectionately so. They're actually looking for something like as a nickname or as a pet name or as a, a name, but they don't really find it loving. You know, they want to see your implicit understanding of what that word means within its context. So for 2B.2, just make sure that you're reading it correctly within the context of the statement. OK, little trick, sneaky one, hey? And then the third one is, again, it's it's like for like. So responsibility, I've gone for you're in charge. Yeah, you're in control. The, the, all of those people belong to your care or to your charge. OK, so that's question 2B. Question 2C. Uh, is a bigger question. OK, it's another use your own words. OK, so it's really important that you're not just paraphrasing and it asks you to choose one example from the text below this bit to explain how the writer suggests how difficult it is for Adam to deal with his patients. OK, so um, I've underlined this little bit here because it's really important that you focus your example on what the examiner is pointing you towards, which is difficult to deal with patients, not just difficult in general, difficult to deal with patients. So there are all sorts of things that you could choose, but it's only one example that they want. And you can use phrases. So you can use sort of up to three, four words. So, for example, you might want to choose build your own burger. That's a four word phrase. It's actually a compound noun here. Um, and think about the way that it's suggesting that you have got multiple symptoms layered on top of each other that change all the time. And um, and it's quite a sort of like 
uh, ironic statement. It's also quite dismissive, build your own burger. You might think about symptoms layered again. Um, the idea about being essentially untrained A&E department, um, endless stream, worryingly sick. Do you see what I mean? There are so many choices. So you as the individual have got to make sure that you choose something that you can get a comprehensive explanation for. I think choosing two words, a two word phrase is wiser because then you get to explain both sides. I think sometimes when you just go for one word, it's quite difficult to make it as comprehensive. So I've chosen endless stream. I mean, you could obviously have done sink or swim. That's a great one as well. Um, so here's my example. The difficulty Adam experiences is presented through the phrase endless stream. So I've quoted it. I'm very, very clearly showing which bit I'm using. So do put quote marks around your answer. The adjective endless suggests that the pressure is continuous and unrelenting. There is no relief from the challenges of the job. So I have literally said one, two, three things about that adjective. And I've used a little bit of terminology just to boost it up a little bit. The image of a stream, OK, so the second part of it, the image of a stream almost suggests that challenging patients or symptoms are steadily flowing in without any stop, emphasising how difficult the work must be. So I've been as comprehensive as I can, as I can. I've explained both bits of the phrase that I've explained and I've sort of said two things about each one to secure my three marks okay and now the biggie okay so this is the the chunky monkey part of the paper where you have to reread two paragraphs two and four and then choose three different uh words or phrases from each paragraph and explain um their impact now the first thing that i want to draw your attention to is these two bits so when you're looking at paragraph two you know that what you're aiming for is to choose three things that express something about adam's progress so you're aiming to find almost like an overview you, ne you need to start and think right well what is his progress through training like find some adjectives to describe it and then find three examples that back up those ideas likewise describe the daytime work as a junior doctor so in terms of how you begin and what your sort of topic sentence should be, they should be linked to the to these ideas. OK, next thing I want to draw your attention to is this sentence. Your choices should include the use of imagery. Make it easy for your examiner to see that you have done that by using the word image or imagery in your response. Avoid it creates an image in the reader's head with nothing else. That's a bit of a kind of um english analysis faux pas you've got to be you've got to be specific um but i really recommend that you keep your focus on how the images present the progress through training or the daytime work as a junior doctor don't use this to start your sentence yeah the writer uses language to convey meaning and to create effect in paragraph two for example, that's just a nonsense statement. It doesn't mean anything. OK, so here is the first paragraph and you'll notice that I've underlined a couple of things or four things, actually, that personally I would be quite tempted in looking at. In fact, I've got five. I've got fairly gargantuan undertaking like a superhero onto the ward armed with exhaustive knowledge. It came as a blow remotely prepared. So if I'm thinking about my overview, what I'm saying about Adam's progress, I'm going to be thinking to myself that obviously it was incredibly hard work and that he had a sense of excitement about it, but then perhaps felt let down by the reality of the job. That's the overview of his progress, like how he changed through it. And this is what I've written. Hmm, somewhere. There it is. OK, Adam highlights how training was hard work through the phrase gargantuan undertaking. There's my first one. This makes the training sound arduous and exhausting with the noun undertaking, making it sound like a difficult task. Notice how I am explaining the connotations of the words. The hyperbole, you could say exaggeration as well, gargantuan 
means colossal or enormous and so emphasizes the sheer volume of work. OK, so that's my first bit. I'm not separating this out into separate paragraphs. I'm writing one big paragraph on that first paragraph and I'm smashing in all three things. I don't have time or word count. Yeah, because you've only got between 200 and 300 words for the whole shebang. However, he is also very excited, as shown in the simile, like a superhero. This creates an image of a comic book character, making the job sound exciting and glamorous. And it also puts more focus on saving lives. So notice I've used a bit of terminology. I've made sure that I've drawn attention to the fact that I'm commenting on imagery, even though I've already said simile, but just to be certain. And then I've given some interpretation. One, exciting. Two, glamorous. Three, focus on saving lives. So I'm being as comprehensive as I can. And then finally, However, this is contrasted with the reality of the work. It came as a blow suggests that he was shocked to find he was unprepared. The noun blow creates an image of pain or suffering, perhaps that his breath has been taken away by his lack of preparation and understanding of what the job would entail. OK, so I'm happy with that. That comes in at about 140 words. So I'm bang on target. Don't waste time counting your words in the exam. Just like through practicing, learn what two to three hundred words looks like. And then, you know, if you're two words over, no one's going to get upset. OK, the next paragraph. OK, so again, just like before, I've underlined the ones that I think would be useful. Doctors trooping past, hypnotized duckling, cocked to one side in a caring manner. That's probably is the longest that you're going to get out. You're not going to want any longer than that. Dozens, sometimes hundreds of tasks. Here are the kinds of things that I personally would think about. And again, my overview, I'm thinking, oh, now that he's doing the job, he actually finds it quite um, like menial, like meaningless in some ways. Like he's just putting on a show that it's just like a series of events that it doesn't it's not as exciting as as he thought. So it's almost like a bit of a letdown. And this is how I've gone, you know, uh, gone to respond. Adam suggests the daytime work feels disappointing. He uses the simile hypnotized duckling. There I go, which suggests he's following the doctors without real thought or onus. It also makes him sound naive and vulnerable as ducklings are small and young. He has no control. Comprehensive response. The phrase cocked to one side in a caring manner makes his response to patients sound disingenuous, like he's simply playing a part. It creates the image of someone pretending to listen and only seeming to care. Finally, he makes the admin work seem meaningless and over the top through dozens, sometimes hundreds. The numbers aren't precise and increase in volume, highlighting how out of control the admin can seem. It suggests that at times the workload wouldn't be possible to manage. So each three quotes or phrases that I have quoted, I should say, I have given a comprehensive explanation of, I've drawn focus to the connotations of the words in their context. I have used some terminology where possible, you know, things like simile um, or even just word classes like adjectives and noun and I've nouns. And I've been careful to ensure that I've used the, the words image or imagery in my response just to help my examiner see that I'm hitting the requirements. My last point on this is sometimes students get worried because they can see something that they know is good, like they know is has been chosen like for this, but they don't 100 percent know what the words mean. You should be able to find enough that you can understand. OK, so if like that's why I've chosen sort of four or five things in each, because I can go, let's say, for example, your head cocked to one side in a caring manner. Let's say that you weren't sure what it meant by cocked to one side. You didn't know that it meant like Ooh. you could still you could still look at in a caring manner or you could kind of figure it out from its context. Um, but try not to write about words that you don't understand. Try and find things that you can make sensible judgments about. OK, so last uh, but not least, just a few top tips to see you through on these parts of the paper. So I'd recommend about 35 minutes on this section. That includes the reading. OK, um, so you could almost 
imagine that you're going to spend maybe five, 10 minutes on the reading and then maybe five to 10 minutes on the uh, questions up to uh, 2C, uh, which gives you a, a nice 20 ish minutes for writing your response um, to the big one to D. Make sure that you read that blurb to work out the context. Read the extract carefully first. Then once you've read it through, like read it through at least once before you start tackling those questions and then just scan and skim through for your responses. Watch out for responses that require implicit understanding of meaning. OK, so thinking about that one in two B. Be comprehensive whenever you have got a three mark question. Make sure that you draw attention to the connotations and meanings of all of the words within a particular phrase. Um, make sure you say a good two to three things per word choice. Um, make sure you comment on imagery in 2D. And this is all for 2D, these bits. Explicit and implicit meanings of the words and phrases that you're choosing. Go to the connotations of the word choices again in their context, because some words have more than one meaning, for example. So make sure you're using them in the right context and have an overview in mind for each paragraph. So before you start reading, using those bullet points at the top, think, right, what is my overview answer to this? And that should help you structure your response. I didn't put this on the list, but I also thoroughly recommend just doing one paragraph with all three examples in for the first bit and then one paragraph with all three examples in the second i think if you're going to try and split it out and go point evidence analysis for six you're gonna maybe spend um too many words and too much time on it so as far as i'm concerned and all the exemplars i've seen they've whacked it all into you know two paragraphs with three examples in each Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much for watching. I hope that was helpful. Give me a shout if you've got any questions, as always, um, and I will get back to you. Do subscribe if you're finding these videos useful, because it's super useful for me when you subscribe as well. And then you'll get um, notifications and such if uh, when I've got new videos coming. That's it from me. Thank you again. Happy revising.